There is no such thing as an it factor. All an it factor is, is somebody that really, really understands and truly believes and lives their brand. And because of that, they have the confidence, right? So the audience sees immediately, wow, confidence, but also a very clear and concise brand. And that is the it factor. You are now listening to the Going North Podcast with your host, author and speaker, Dom Bregman. And every Monday and Thursday, you're going to hear the voice of a different author share their stories, expertise, and their struggles that they had to overcome in life to leave you inspired to get more out of your life. Be sure to not only listen to this episode, but share with others, connect with the authors, and always advance others to advance yourself. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Going North Podcast, where we bring you some fabulous humans from across the globe who put pen to paper and are out on the metaphorical digital road to promote their work and all the good things that they and their colleagues are doing. Today is no different because we got another fabulous author in the building. We got another fabulous author in the building, y'all. This wonderful lady right here, oh my goodness, this lady right here, she spent 10 years with the Sony Music Entertainment, where she became one of the company's youngest executives at the age of 28. My goodness. And during her fabulous tenure, she spearheaded the artist development and marketing for globally recognized brands, including Carrie Underwood, Brad Paisley, and Johnny Cash. Ah, cha-ching. Among hundreds of other artists from Arista, RCA, Columbia, and Epic, as well as Monument Records. So she is a veteran in the music industry. And not only that, she served more than a decade on the National Advisory Board for Musicians on Call. So through all that, she's become an expert who specializes in marketing and transforming people into viable brands by offering insurmountable knowledge to teach others what it takes to become a powerful influencer. Everyone is in the marketing arena, keeps discussing the power of influencers, but no one is discussing how an influencer becomes powerful. Now she redefines the term influencer by expanding its scope offline, highlights positive psychology principles in terms of branding, and reveals the proprietary brand matrix to help entrepreneurs discover their authentic and competitive brand. And on top of that, she's a consultant and speaker that's also been an adjunct professor for six years, teaching disciplines in marketing and music business at multiple colleges and universities, including SMU's Timberlands Advertising Institute. She has a BBA from Belmont University's Mike Kerb School of Music Business and a Master of Liberal Studies from Southern Methodist University. And on top of all that fabulousness, she lives in Dallas with her husband and daughter. Let's give it up for the fabulous, lovely leader herself, Ms. Laura Bull. How are you today, ma'am? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great having you on the podcast. Congrats. Welcome to the business of immortality. <laughs> wow, that's a daunting. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. From individual to empire, how's it feel? Oh, it feels great. I'm just, you know, the whole purpose of writing this book was just to help people. And so, and I'm already getting feedback that it is super helpful. So that's just, that's a blessing. That's right. It's not in disguise either. Well, actually, it's probably disguised as a book full of information. It's probably the disguise. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness, my goodness. Well, as with all introductions, there's always a cavity or two that still needs to be filled. So anything that I've missed that needs to be filled in about the fabulous Laura? Uh, no, that was that was more than enough. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything else to share on that one. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Hit all the I's and crossed all the T's and maybe some X's too. Yes, in. Indeed. Yes, indeed. So what led you to be a part of Sony Music Entertainment? I mean, I always had a creative side to me. And so, and, and honestly, I thought I was going to go into the, the actual creative music side 
of the equation. I was a musician myself, not a good one, but <laughs> <laughs> I could speak the language and I was planning on going into the A&R department, which they're the ones that are hands-on with the music and helping really the style and developing the albums themselves and which songs to put on there and everything. And fell into the marketing side and I realized just how creative and fun that side could be. And I just never looked back. Ah, so they got you good. That's good. That's yeah. fun. And that's fabulous too. And, and that actually is a good thing about marketing, especially when you get to do it well, is that it takes a lot of creativity. It does take, it is a lot of people hear marketing and they think, Oh, data analysis. Oh, you know, and it's really not that. And I always say, you know, you can, if you can dream it up in marketing, it can happen. And that's, it's one of the most creative fields you can get into. And it's so true. And that's actually something folks don't think about when you hear the term marketing, like most folks probably hate it <laughs> at first yeah. glance. Yeah. Most artists that I know when they think marketing, they think, uh, selling out or, you know, so it's just a, a pain that they don't really want to deal with. But in honesty, you know, the ones that are super successful are the ones that embrace the marketing side and really get into it and, and actually help move that marketing side along to their brand of choice. And, and that's, you know, Garth Brooks is known for being very hands-on in his marketing and Kenny Chesney, I, I know firsthand he is and Brad Paisley is and the people that are hands-on are the ones that have the very long, long life in their business. Yeah, that's so true indeed, because that's really how you can have a long life in business is if you stay creative and you stay relevant, and that can even reinvent some things you may have done before. Right, but it's also uh, just as important to stay consistent in your brand. A lot of people, so what, what I work with influencers in the sense of First off, there's this misconception out there that influencers are only online influencers and this Instagram marketplace anomaly. And it's really not. I've been working with influencers before they were called influencers. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you could call Aristotle an influencer. I mean, you, there are so many people that are just as influential to populations offline as they are online. George Clooney doesn't even have social media. And numerous other people. Johnny Cash never had social media, but he's a huge influencer. So, you know, that's one of the misconceptions that I'm trying to clear up in this book. And the other one is that when it comes to influencer branding, you know, you're really taking a personal brand and turning it into a business like a Nike shoe. So I'm taking a person and turning it into a Martha Stewart, right? So when you take that and you make it into a, a Nike shoe, that Nike shoe is not supposed to change over time. It, it can evolve along the marketplace, you know, but it's not supposed to change its core elements of what it is and the values that it stands for. Well, a person is completely different because first off, they have a personality. They're not, you know, a Nike shoe, you put a personality onto it. A person already has a personality. So not only does that bring in psychological issues that have to be figured out but you know a person is going to naturally change over time they're going to have their priorities are going to change and shift they're going to have life experiences that take them down different paths and I really get into how do you evolve as a person and evolve and grow as a brand without changing those core elements of what that brand actually is you know, a lot of influencers get really concerned about that because they think, oh, well, if I'm supposed to be consistent in my brand from day one, how am I supposed to be creative? And how am I supposed to be able to show all these different aspects? Well, you can, but there is a way to do it that is correct. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And it's great that you're on that mission because you're, you're right. There are tons of folks who are influencers before the whole social media, Instagram age. And it's not just the whole social media thing. It's like, hey, it's actually kind of better for some folks to not be on social media as a quote unquote influencer because they may need to have their core values in line. Well, yeah. So, you know, somebody asked me the other day, what do you say to people who are introverts that are also musicians or also, uh, you know, painters or people that do need to influence an audience to purchase what they're selling? 
And it, the, the clear answer there is that not all brands, it, it's not natural for all brands to be in an online social media, you know, platform. You know, there are other ways to influence populations. And by the way, not all celebrities are influential and not all influencers are celebrities, right? We have local town mayors and clergy that are just, in, just as influential over the population, their target audience as Oprah is over her target audience, you know? So it's, there's, you can have different levels of influencers on different platforms all over the world. That's right. That's right. Indeed. That's right. Indeed. Yeah. Cause it's not like a 90 year old grandmother who doesn't have a smartphone is going to be like, Oh, a social media influencer. Sounds like a biscuit to me. Let me go to my past and ask about this. Yeah. It's all about your target audience too. You know, that comes into it. And that's why this goes beyond personal branding into a business element of what I'm calling influencer branding because the target audience should also dictate, you know, it's a, what comes first, the egg or the chicken scenario, but they play off of each other. And it's a, it's more of a cyclical cycle of figuring out, okay, if this is my target audience because of the elements of my brand and because of my personality and our shared values, if that's the target audience, how do they need to hear this message? You know, and then that's what dictates how you actually present it via marketing. So there's a big difference between branding strategy and marketing strategy. And I always say, you know, marketing strategy is what you want to say for the next 20 days and branding strategy is what you want to say for the next 20 years. So, and, and all of your marketing strategy is going to be dependent on your brand. And so that's why you have to really figure out what your brand is before you even start to even look at the marketing strategy. Uh, that's powerful right there. That is powerful right there indeed. And that's a great distinction between the two. That's a great way to see them differently, like branding and marketing, because heck, even myself can be guilty as charged to sometimes see them a little bit close together as both, but it's really not. A brand is something that you want to have down concrete of what you want it to be 20 years now, as opposed to a marketing strategy, which is like, what, 20 days or a little bit longer, a little bit shorter? Yeah. I mean, it depends on the marketing strategy. You know, you can have marketing strategy that lasts a year, but that's, I'm just trying to use that to, you know, illustrate the point. And, you know, your marketing strategy can help evolve your brand strategy over time. Like if you're, if you're paying attention to the analytical data that's coming back with marketing strategy, you can figure out how that's going to affect your brand uh, short term and long term so that you're constantly just, you know, checking back in with your brand and making sure that it's where it needs to be. You know, if you're, if you're a Martha Stewart, you know, she's obviously gone through a lot of hills and valleys, you know, during her long, long career, but from somebody who started as a, um, a caterer and turned into a published author who turned that into merchandising lines and all these massive partnership deals and, you know, magazines. And, you know, I think she just released like her hundredth book or something crazy. Uh, you know, it's it, it, it IPOs, you know, she's like, she's, <laughs> yeah, she's there, you know, I mean, she is a brand like a Nike shoe, but if you look at that over time and how that's evolved, it still makes sense to her brand, what she's doing now with Snoop Dogg on VH1. But, you know, so the core values of her brand hasn't changed, but yet by doing this show with Snoop Dogg, she is hitting a new audience. She's keeping things fresh. You know, she's, she's re, she's re-evaluating where her brand is to grow it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's kind of like reflecting on, like what's worked in the past and what didn't work. And, and always trying new things. You know, she's big on really, she's a constant learner. She wants to learn new things and try new things. And, and as long as it stays in, and, and my whole thing about the evolution of brands is as long as it stays within the, the core elements that, and, and my book really helps you 
uh, there's an easy strategy in my book and I do a lot of exercises throughout my book so the readers can really develop their brand on their own. But it's all about determining what those core values are and those core, I call them brand pillars. Whatever those brand pillars are, they cannot change. They have to be authentic to you as you know the brand person. Um, and, and it has to be competitive in the marketplace. But everything else about a person can change and grow. Or like I use the example of Taylor Swift. She could dye her hair brown and it has no difference to her brand. It makes no bearing. You know, there's, there's no changes to her overall brand if she dyes her hair brown. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, because just a color change. Cause, I mean, heck, all of us has to go through a color change one of these days, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, but then, but then if you look at like pink, you know, when she went blonde, that was a big deal because pink hair was like her shtick. But if you look at the elements, the core elements weren't re- really changed. It was just a pretty good evolution there. So, you know, again, it's like she still stands for the same stuff, which is, you know, a little bit rebellious. And that's where that pink hair came in in the first place, you know, but, um, but even dyeing her hair blonde didn't affect those core values of her brand. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. And it's definitely true. It's like, heck, even a little shock value to the folks who are so used to seeing things <laughs> in one way and don't like change spark a little bit of tension too so definitely definitely true definitely true indeed well you mentioned that you work with some fabulous celebrities so is so out of all of this is this might be a tough one is there a particular one that has really been most influential to you after working with them that have helped you to really change your life for the better um, I think it, it's definitely a collection because it's it really opened my eyes when I was younger at how important it was that each person came out with their own clear identity. And, you know, you can't really mimic what other artists are doing. You can't really mimic what anybody. So an author can't do what another author does, you know, and a comedian can't do what another comedian does because we already have the rock. We already have Kevin Hart. We already have an Ellen. We already have an Oprah, you know, these people and there's clear differences between them. So if you're looking at Oprah versus Ellen, Oprah is all about teaching people how to take care of themselves and better themselves and spirituality and and things like that, where Ellen is more about taking care of your fellow person and, you know, be kind to one another and, And so it's more of an outward, you know, taking care of other people. So it's, those are two very different elements to those brands, even though they're both hosts, you know, TV hosts. Yeah, definitely true. Just getting the elements right. Just making sure you have your own thing. Cause I think that's also kind of like a big problem nowadays that folks are kind of taking the, emulation thing a little too seriously and trying to be copies of everyone else. Yeah. The only people that are successful are the ones that are unique. I mean, that's, that's true today. It was true a hundred years ago and it'll be true 300 years from now. I mean, you have to be unique and you have to be competitive in the marketplace. But the good news is, is that you can have qualities to your brand that are similar to other people. But as long as you have one thing in the group of brand pillar elements that really, you know, sets you apart. Like the goal is to be able to write the core elements of your brand on a wall and have anybody be able to say that's so-and-so, you know, and that's really the key to being able to, it's the group together. So I always say, um, like if you use the one element of, you know, a powerhouse vocalist, you know, that could apply to so many people, Carrie Underwood, Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, Adele, you know, there's so many people that fall under that one category. However, if you add mod or British elements to it, well, that could only be Adele out of those four people that I just mentioned. You see what I'm saying? 
So it is whatever, you know, it is the group of things that make you a unique influencer that is going to set you apart. It doesn't have to be just one thing. Ah, uh, beautiful right there. Beautiful right there. And it's so darn true. We don't need any more copycats and heck even one of the other things listed here is that what, what does a healthy influencer look like? Yeah. So if an influencer is unhealthy, that means their business is unhealthy because a lot of times an influencer doesn't realize that they are the CEO of their business. A lot of times influencers don't realize, especially the more creative ones, they don't realize that they are entrepreneurs. They don't want to put themselves in that category, but they really are. So, and, and then there's the element of the fact that they are also the product that they are selling. So if there are issues with that product or are, if the audience isn't responding the way that you would hope that they would, you know, it's really hard for a lot of influencers to separate themselves as a person from themselves as a product. And so it's very important, especially in this influencer marketplace where they need to understand certain psychological elements that will help them succeed in the long term. And so I have the top five P's of successful influencers. And those are things like positivity and perseverance and passion and purpose and, and power. And these five psychological elements if you, for instance, if you don't have positivity or if you're not, you don't lean towards a positive outlook on things, or if you, you're not the most perseverance, you know, driven person, those things can be taught. Those things can be learned. And not only that, but all five of these elements really have to play into the brand itself. And that's never really been talked about from a branding strategy viewpoint in the marketing arena as a person, you do have to have these elements actually work into, and, and how do you work them into your brand? And the goal is, is that, you know, there's really no such thing as an it factor. I've worked with all of them. I promise there is no such thing as an it factor. All an it factor is, is somebody that really, really understands and truly believes and lives their brand. And because of that, they have the confidence right? So the audience sees immediately, wow, confidence, but also a very clear and concise brand. And that is the it factor. And so, you know, how, how do you learn to incorporate these things into being a, a successful influencer? You know, it, it's really not about talent. Everybody in the world has talent in something. It is more about, you know, these, these five traits that you really need to be able to have a healthy business and a healthy outlook long-term. But that's something new and powerful right there. Like the whole it factor thing. There is no it factor. It's just a confidence factor and just really having a crystal clear view of how you see yourself and living that out. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely both together because you can have confidence and still have a, a confusing brand and people will be like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> right you are confident you know <laughs> but it's really about having that clear unique brand too that's when you're like oh, okay i got it you know that makes sense and that is cool and that is refreshing and i am drawn to that for whatever reason and and it is also important to note that not everybody is going to love every brand but it is important to make sure that your brand is authentic to the audience that you're trying to reach. And by doing so, or to do so, you should use shared values. And, and I call you know, it's a shared identity basically um, with that audience so that they really feel a connection. And then they feel that um, trust and trust is really a two way street when it comes to influencing people. And so um, if they don't feel that trust, then they're not going to buy into the brand. Yeah, it's true. And that's such a high thing these days is trust and just building that trust and presenting yourself as trustworthy because a lot of folks, they're tired of being pitched to, they're tired of being sold to. I mean, it's like a lot of folks have kind of like abused the 
power of technology and just really getting themselves out there so much is that a lot of folks just have their antennas and their seventh eyes up. I mean, it's not just the third eye too. They probably even got like a five leaf clover somewhere just to try to detect BS. Yeah. And you know, the thing too is authenticity is such a big factor, but what people, what a lot of people don't realize is that authenticity is a two way street too. So I could be living my most authentic brand, but if the, if one person in, you know, category A doesn't understand that brand in their perception of the world, then it's not authentic to them, right? So that's why it's even more important to really hone in on the target audience that does understand that brand and does, you know, it is authentic to them as well. So not only do you have to be authentic, but it also has to be authentic to the people that are receiving that message. Oh, yeah, that's right. True authenticity. Not like a pleather jacket. That's not authenticity. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, a corn cob is going to come out eventually, at least metaphorically. Well, for those who pick up your magical book, what what do you think is one of the biggest takeaways you believe that they will receive from after picking up and reading the book? So the goal is, you know, every, every chapter has exercises and I take you through a process from start to finish. So the goal is for you to really understand your, your personal brand and then develop that in a way to turn it into a strong, powerful, authentic, competitive influencer brand. The first part of my book is all about the psychology and the the psychology of influence and my top five P's of successful influencers. And then the second part of the book is, is my proprietary brand matrix, which really helps break down the three major elements of a brand, which are product, image, and narrative, and then shows the reader how those coexist to be able to decipher what those brand pillars are. And then the third part of the book is really about boosting what you have into, you know, making it a business. So it really gets into the evolution uh, that we discussed earlier. And it also discusses things like private versus public narrative, which, you know, you have to have some elements of your private life show in the public narrative, but obviously you don't have to have everything. And honestly, you don't want everything because that's just too unfocused for a brand. So it's, you know, going back and forth about what private elements of your personal life do you need to show in a brand. So all of those things kind of factor into the long-term longevity. So really, as you work through the book in order and with the exercises, by the end, you should have a clear idea about what your brand pillars are, but also I take it a step further and I have the reader actually write out a brand statement, which is really just a mission statement, but it's a brand statement that will really provide them focus for the long term so that they have a clear, concise mission statement for their business. And listen, every corporation on the planet has mission statements. And I'm surprised that literally no influencers have, you know, so I'm, again, on a mission there to make sure that people have their brand statements written out so that they really can focus and so that their team, as they hire people and they grow their team and really build out the business aspect of it, they'll understand the brand just as much because that's just as important. Sweet. And what's Laura's brand statement? (laughs) Yeah, you'll have to read my book. (laughs) Oh, yeah, because I need to get past chapter one because I just snagged the ebook this morning, got through the Beyonce part of it. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, it's it's very, I know it sounds analytical the way I'm I'm discussing it, but like you said, Beyonce, each chapter is kind of focused around a story of, an, of a very mega powerful influencer, but they're from all over industries. So there's authors and actors and musicians and comedians and of course Martha Stewart's in a category of her own (laughs) so 
it's really more. And then of course there's lots of stories about people I've worked with, you know, some unnamed, some named. And so it's really a lot of stories put together. So hopefully it's just as entertaining as it is informative. Oh yeah. Definitely with the commercial. Yes, indeed. And the, the, yeah. The do you Depot. like the commercial? <laughs> oh yes. The home Depot as some call it. Yeah, the Home Depot. It's funny <laughs> I was actually using that. The way that that came about is I was actually using that example in a class and I was using it to prove the reverse. <laughs> and then as I was saying it, I was like, wait, this is exactly, I was trying to say, you know, Beyonce and Home Depot would not make sense together. But then as I started, you know, presenting it and getting further in, I was like, actually, if you do this, this totally makes sense. Okay, let's make the commercial do this, you know, and then, and then, so now that's what I use. And it's kind of funny how that came about. Heck yeah, indeed. That's what I'm talking about. So will there be your own version of that commercial for Laura in the book? <laughs> I, I keep waiting to see if like, you know, well, first off, this book just came out, but I think it'd be funny if like a year from now we see a Home Depot commercial featuring Beyonce. And like the Super Bowl or something. <laughs> and you know, folks are going to be asked for that audio book too. Yeah. You know, there's no plans to do that right now just because it's, there's so many exercises throughout the book that like, for me, I like to write and make notes. And so the paperback is great, but there's also, you know, if you buy the book, you can get the workbook online and so you can write notes on that and really get in there. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of notes that you need to write about yourself and like work it out. And, and so I, I, I don't know if it even would make sense to do an audio book. I don't know. I'm still playing with that. Oh, yes, indeed. Especially for those serious folks. Those have to pause when they're running and just grab the notepad and actually start writing. Yeah. <laughs> And then wave at the birds. Or leave a voice memo for yourself. Oh, even better. See, there we go. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. Well, coming down to podcast to the question that every guest gets to receive. Are you ready to the, receive the present? Okay, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> so what if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again in the current year of 2020 with all of your mass knowledge and experience? What advice would you give to yourself? I think that a lot of advice that I actually give in the book <laughs> is advice I would write to myself. A lot of the things about the psychology of being a healthy influencer and you know, work-life balance and separating yourself from work when you need to just to get a clear vision. Because I'll tell you what, right after I left Sony, I went for two weeks overseas and I did like a backpacking trip with my brother actually through Ireland and Scotland and, and um, England. And we were chasing our ancestors because I'm, I'm related to one of the presidents. And because of that, we were able to find our gene genealogy back to the year 1000. And so we were literally able to go to, you know, historical places and castles and battlefields and farms that our family had, you know, crossed paths on or owned or, or whatnot. And it's just, it was so enlightening in the sense of, it, it just made you realize what a big world you actually live in. And it gives you that perspective of thinking outside of the bubble. And I, I had realized that I was in a bubble for so long that, you know, especially for marketing people, and for influencers of all kinds, you just have to constantly, you know, just check out and learn things or go, you know, experience life or go experience something. And I think that that is probably the biggest because I went straight from high school to college and I didn't even I was a sophomore in college when I got started at Sony. So I was just boom, 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 work, work, work. And I think that definitely taking a step back and being able to actually live and have experiences is such a gift. You can, it's the best gift you can give yourself. Ah, beautiful right there. Beautiful right there. That's How great. does that hold up to the other people's answers? <laughs> I like how you said, get out of your bubble instead of get out your box. 
Yeah. It just, you got to get out of your, you, you end up in a bubble and you got to be careful about that bubble. You know, your bubble of the people around you, like you have the same thoughts and the same ideas because you feed off of the people around you, right? Just adding one new person to that bubble changes things that you don't even realize. You know what I mean? So I think that's a big thing. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right indeed. Bigger than Texas, maybe. No, nah, I don't know about that. Oh. <laughs> 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 Fabulous. Woohoo! Well, it's Texas wins again. So, for those who can cont- want to continue to win with folks from Texas like yourself, what's the best way for folks to reach out and connect with you? So on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at the Laura Bull, and on Facebook, I'm at Laura Bull Branding. And of course, the book is available everywhere, ebook and paperback. Well, there you have it, folks. Go on out there, snag a copy or 55 of the wonderful book from Individual to Empire, a guide to building an authentic and powerful brand from the lovely, legendary Laura Bull herself. And follow her on all the social medias. Keep up with what she's doing because she's got some good stuff cooking indeed. Some good stuff cooking indeed. That's right. So any parting words for the folks still listening, Laura? No, I just, um, you know, I hope that they feel the empowerment and really take ownership over their brand because at the end of the day, they're the only ones that can really propel themselves and really build their business. So I think that it's easier said than done. I don't want them to be afraid of this big, crazy term of branding strategy. I don't want anybody to get, you know, freaked out (laughs) about it. It's, it's, Totally doable. Hey there, buddy. Looks like you made it to the end of this episode. Since you made it to the end of this episode, do both of us a favor and stop being greedy. Stop it right now and share this episode with your friends and your fellow podcast lovers, especially those who have book clubs and want to listen to the authors who write some amazing books.